to the Welcome everybody to the first webinar of the Open Educational Practice Special Interest Group as sponsored by Ascolite. Um, as um, you are aware, we're going to start this year with a webinar on open access publishing and uh, Jessica Teal will be joining us in just one moment. But before we begin, uh, there's a couple of things that I wanted to cover so that we can settle in. So Stephen, uh, Stephen Chang who joins us today from the Trobe is um, our webinar uh, scheduler and he is responsible for our program. So many thanks, Stephen, for today. And if you stick around, like all good movies, after the credits today, you'll be able to get a sneak peek at what we're doing next month as well. I would ask that unless you are asking a question, uh, if you could make sure that your microphones are off, please. Uh, during the time that this webinar is running, we have a chat facilitator, that's Angie Williamson from uh, Deakin University, and you'll see Angie in the uh, the chat and if you have any questions queries you can certainly put them in there and that way when you get a reply from Angie you'll know that um, she is meant to be uh, to, to be looking after the community in that space um, we will have time for questions and so as you have questions that arise please feel free to put them in the chat just even as a placeholder so that when we get to the question time you haven't forgotten them and if you don't want to put them out verbally, please feel free just to, to um, indicate that and Angie can ask them on your behalf. Just a reminder that this session will be recorded and it will be released via the SIG YouTube channel early next week and that will be under a uh, Creative Commons 4.0 international attribution license. Please feel free as well to tweet during the session using the hashtag OEPSIG. Now, now that we're settled in and hopefully everyone has a warm beverage or beverage of choice, let us begin the webinar. I would like to begin the webinar with an acknowledgement of country. And I think that this is incredibly important for open practitioners, especially because we are very much interested in not only sharing knowledge, but one of the cornerstones of openness is attribution, knowing who came before us and how we build upon that knowledge and how we deal with knowledge respectfully. And so I think that an acknowledgement of country is exceptionally important for all open practitioners. And that's what I would like to do this morning. So on behalf of USQ, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we gather. We would also like to pay our respect to elders, past, present and emerging. I will hand over now to Stephen and he can introduce our guest for today. Thank you very much, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Good to see you all here. Um, Jessica is someone who has a really unique set of skills and background and in both law and open scholarship. Um, she's worked for Universities Australia in copyright, um, is a member of Creative Commons Australia and is also a PhD candidate in the Digital Media Research Centre at QUT. Her full bio is on the uh, Asklite OEP website um, and on the current slides if you want to look at that further. Um, yeah, so we're very happy to have you here, Jess, and uh, take it away. Hello everyone, I'm just trying to share my screen. There we go. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for the very warm introduction, Stephen and Adrian. It really is so exciting to be here today and get to present at the webinar. I've attended a number of your webinars before and to actually get to present my research to everyone is really, really quite an honor. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'd like to start by um, also acknowledging the, the traditional owners of the land um, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, I live 
in um, a rural country town in central Queensland and paying the respects to the traditional owners of this land is very important to me as well. So thank you very much. Um, today I'm going to talk about my research in open publishing and higher education. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about why I started this research. Um, as you heard from Stephen, I worked in copyright law and policy and in the open space in a number of different roles. And it became quite, I became quite aware that um, whilst Australia was progressing open education, um, we weren't going at quite the pace that some of the other comparable jurisdictions were moving at. And um, I thought that perhaps there could be something I could do to help contribute to solving some of the problems with publishing in higher education. I believe that the market for publishing textbooks is flawed. And that as a collective, those of us who are working in higher education, we have the capacity to do something to make real changes regarding the way content is accessed and used. And I know in this group, many of you also have that belief and that hope. And I believe part of the reason Australia has somewhat struggled to progress a cohesive open movement as wide reaching as some of our countries um, overseas that are comparable is because we have limited localized data and we don't yet have a concrete roadmap to guide our stakeholders towards a large scale movement. And I know many of my peers, some of you here on this um, webinar are also undertaking research in this space. And it's my hope that together our research can provide the puzzle pieces to make this real difference occur. As my research indicates, open publishing and higher education relies on collective action and collaboration. So I think this research is important, not only because there are numerous benefits to open publishing in general. I think that there's a real opportunity for progress and innovation through the broader adoption of open publishing in Australia's higher education sector. And I think this broader adoption has the potential to make a real difference with respect to significant issues, such as those contained in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And even more broadly with respect to human development in general. So what my research investigates is the way open publishing and higher education operates. And I propose that open publishing can be a viable alternative to traditional publishing and that when positioned to succeed can actually support and progress human development. So my research looks at open publishing and higher ed and I use, case, uh, I use textbooks as my case study. Um, and although there is a focus specifically on what makes a, a successful open textbook model, um, I also believe that my work can be applied more broadly with open publishing and higher education in general. The development of open publishing in higher education has challenged many aspects of the publishing industry, specifically with respect to the way copyright and the exclusive bundle of rights are viewed, viewed by the public, by publishers, by individuals, by authors. The complexities involved with open publishing have made this area a source of confusion, frustration, and great success over the past decade. My research looks at open publishing in higher ed and I hope to uncover a roadmap of sorts to help guide the future. Specifically, I look at a couple of key research questions. So I look at what models are most commonly used? How do people choose between them? What motivates people? What barriers do they come across? What sort of trade-offs are involved? Let's talk about the decision-making that these people engage with within these open models. I look at what models best support human development. Early on in my research, I found that there were two common models in open publishing and higher ed. I categorized these as the itch scratching model and the peaceful revolutions model. The first model is the itch scratching model, which is primarily a non-monetary market model of production, which relies to varying extents on peer production and collective action of the community to create the textbook. The term itch scratching is derived from the literature and the free and open source software movement. And it was coined by Eric Raymond, who described the creation of software as scratching a developer's personal itch. 
So the term is then further derived in the literature by Yokai Benkla and his discussion of motivations, where he took Raymond's concept and applied it directly to the idea of peer production, where there was a network of stakeholders working together who had shared goals, values, and beliefs, and they had a dream and they wanted to make their dreams a reality. And that essentially was what the peer production process was. All of these people collectively scratching a personal itch. The second model is the Peaceful Revolutions model which is a large scale instance of cooperation between organizations, institutions, and governments. And they use a direct cross subsidy model of production. These direct cross subsidies operate by leveraging the network of stakeholders to redirect the resourcing. The term peaceful revolutions was coined by Peter Suba in reference to the way the open access movement can be successfully supported by a redirection of resources and how the cooperation of the stakeholders is the way that it is facilitated. So using these two models of open publishing, I propose that there is a, uh, sorry, I propose that there is a narrative which offers open as the new way of things. It's through this narrative that I argue that there are two common models in open publishing, the itch scratching and the peaceful revolutions, and that when these models are positioned to succeed, they can allow open publishing to be a viable alternative to traditional publishing. So my research uses a qualitative research approach, drawing on principles of participatory action research, which I call PAR, and incorporating fieldwork interviews and case study research. I conducted my research in three different um, stages, planning and background, data gathering, and data analysis. One of the most important aspects of my work was being engaged with the open publishing community as both a participant, a contributor, and as an observer. And whilst I was embedded in the open community in several ways, I participated in one in-depth case study, which forms the PAR component of my research. This PAR study was undertaken on the Australian Intellectual Property Law Textbook Project, which is a small contained research project, which was hosted at my institution, QUT. I engaged in the study on the project, which commenced in early 2017 and ran through to mid-2019. The study involved the two project creators, myself as a project manager, the students undertaking the IP unit, the intellectual property um, community in Australia, university staff and open ed practitioners. The focus of the project team was to create an open textbook for Australian IP law that was a true representation of collaboration with students and members of the broader IP community. The key problem which was identified by the project team was that the textbook market is flawed and that the cost of textbooks were high and they wanted to do something about that. The study sought to achieve three key goals. First, we wanted to know whether or not we could produce the open textbook that is free, accessible, and successfully replace traditional textbooks. We also wanted to determine whether we could use and produce the textbook under a collaborative peer production method of production. And third, we wanted to ensure we incorporated student feedback and engagement to address any concerns that had been raised with the course materials previously and ongoing. What we found in the project was that participation was a lot harder to obtain than we initially thought. Mobilization presented a real problem. Barriers such as institutional policy and time also presented issues for the community. Success of the project was reliant on the project team undertaking high workloads and assuming personal costs. All members of the project team, including myself, had to dedicate significant time and energy to the project to ensure it was completed the way we envisaged. In this sense, the motivations of the project team needed to outweigh the potential barriers to success and that the motivations needed to be aligned with pro-social ideals as opposed to traditional economic justifications. We also came in contact with issues of legitimacy, which was more along the lines of a perception of legitimacy. And these concerns were live with both the creators and the students. Overall, the outcomes of the project were that an open textbook successfully replaced the, the traditional textbooks in the course we potentially saved students a significant amount of money and we used the itch scratching model with some um, level of peer production involved. So since the introduction of the open textbook in the IP course, traditional textbooks have not been prescribed to the students. In terms of potential progressive savings, the data indicates that the open textbook has saved students a QT potential of $332,145 over the course of seven years. And it has the potential to continue to save a potential amount of money for years to come. In addition to the potential savings for students, the ongoing benefits of having an open textbook for the course, um, there is also 
the added bonus that it was a springboard for other academics to realize a pathway to creating open both internally at QUT, but also outside of QUT and around Australia. The open textbook is used by a number of universities now. As a result of working with the IP textbook project, I was able to gain hands-on experience relating to the motivations, the barriers and the trade-offs as I personally experienced them, but also as they were experienced by my project stakeholders. I was further able to test my theories regarding the abstraction model of production and gain a better understanding of the social norms, the rules, and the way the community operates. In addition to my path study, I undertook some fieldwork interviews. I did semi-structured interviews with 26 participants conducted between 2018 and 2021. The interviews involved open-ended questions around experiences in open textbook creation. I asked people about their motivations, their barriers, any particular trade-offs. I also asked them about the decision-making. These questions involved three tiers, personal philosophy. Um, I asked them project specific questions and I asked high level questions regarding the utility and future of open. In addition to this field work, I undertook a number of case studies. These projects helped me build an idea of those who were being observed. I gained a better understanding of how decisions were made in a multitude of projects. And by tracking the progress of these case studies, I was able to identify common themes that emerged and cross-check these with my working theories from all of my data. Analyzing all of this data, I used a thematic analysis and I coded around four key themes, funding and resourcing, including economic factors such as efficiency, sustainability, and scalability, motivations, barriers, and human development values such as open, accessibility, inclusivity, bias, diversity, and equity. Based on the first theme of funding and resources, I was able to categorize the projects into those two models, the itch scratching model and the peaceful revolutions model. Using the second and third themes of motivations and barriers, I was able to develop theories regarding the potential trade-offs involved in publishing in these types of models. Um, ultimately, I was able to develop theories and then challenge these against the responses. My analysis wasn't just done at the end of, it, of my research, it was done throughout the duration of it. Um, which allowed me to continue to um, challenge the thoughts I had and then act upon them in the next phase of my research. Some of the findings were that the motives that drive participation in open were primarily non-economic. And I know that might not come as a surprise to those working in this community already, but um, to be able to have localized data which supports this conclusion was really helpful. I found that based on my data and the research um, of others, the personal philosophy was a, one of the main motivators. And this included things such as a strong value for openness. Um, the second was affordability. The third was student success, which of course is linked to affordability due to the issues um, affordability of resources can have on a student's success. And lastly was academic freedom, which offered a pro-social outcome as well as a personal benefit for the creator getting to do the project the way they wanted to do it. All of the projects that I engaged with shared one strong commonality. The participants were involved in an open endeavor and like all open endeavors in the open movement, the participants cared about something. In open, the barriers to success are strong. Open can't be successful unless the participants are strongly motivated to undertake the work. And further, they need to be motivated by pro-social motives. Nothing in my data suggested that participants were primarily motivated, for example, by an economic driver or by the promise of promotion. These incentives are attractive, but in open, there needs to be more. My data also indicated that there were three common barriers. First, costs of the project, including funding, paying fixed costs, supporting production costs, and personal costs accrued by the project team. The second, management of production including gaining contributions, participation, and overseeing participants and editorial work. And lastly, legitimacy of the open project, including perceived legitimacy of the project and the open output. A number of these common barriers that I found for open publishing aligned with traditional functions undertaken by the publisher. Following on from these common barriers, I considered how projects overcame barriers and the potential trade-offs involved. And this was a really interesting aspect of my analysis because it allowed me to see just how high some of the barriers are in open publishing and the amount of um, workload that some of the projects had to assume to ensure success. So this was most dominant in the itch scratching projects where I found that um, the most significant trade-off was around choices the project had to make to overcome limited or absent resourcing. Without resourcing, 
and without the participants to undertake the work, the costs of the project were often converted to personal costs borne by the project team. And these teams were often individuals or very small teams. Personal costs were often accrued when participants in open projects had to trade off on their reputation or their human capital to gain contributions, legitimacy or support. So when they didn't have access to a particular type of um, thing they needed, they often had to assume a personal cost to be able to get that thing they needed. So the trade-offs in the itch scratching model were really high and they were only able to be made when the project team had the capacity to assume the work required. Essentially success in these itch scratching projects was predominantly in the hands of the project team. They needed to have the skills and expertise to complete the work as well as the personal drive. And as a result of this, there was a flow and effect regarding scalability and sustainability of these types of projects. They were often uncertain. Comparatively, in the um, peaceful revolutions model, the majority of barriers that were found in the itch scratching model could be overcome or addressed through the organizational structure of the institution they were embedded in. There is, however, a potential trade-off in moving away from this completely decentralized process that is offered by an itch scratching model. The extreme freedom that is often afforded by completely open systems can be jeopardized to make way for the structure and the bureaucracy that comes with formal organization. This caused some potential problems relating to choice in the publishing process. But so long as the institution was um, ensuring that they embedded open values, open goals and beliefs, there was still the possibility to have ideological alignment. As a result of my analysis, I was able to map um, the conditions for success. And there was some overlap between the models, but there were also instances where they varied. In the itch scratching projects, I found that success was heavily reliant on the project team or individual and the strength of their motivation to undertake the work. Overall, the itch scratching models were best positioned to succeed when they had a dedicated author or team or organization to manage and drive production. They sufficiently engaged with social norms and those social norms were embedded within the community. They had varying levels of granularity in the production process. And what I mean by that is that they offered bite-sized tasks for the participants to easily engage with. If you're seeking to use peer production, there needs to be a varying level of regarding the size of the contributions that you're asking for. In peaceful revolutions, there were four key conditions for success. First was engagement with social norms, and these social norms of cooperation and community were important for that particular model. It also needed to be embedded in an organization or an institution, and they needed to factor in sustainability planning. A number of the successful projects I saw had sustainability planning factored in from day one. They also needed to strike a balance between the motivations of the stakeholders and the commitment required by the stakeholder. Essentially, burdens placed on individual stakeholders or groups of stakeholders should not outweigh the benefit of publishing open. Similar to the itch scratching model, in peaceful revolutions, there needed to be a high level of cooperation between stakeholders to ensure the trade-offs of any one stakeholder didn't outweigh the benefit. Unlike the itch scratching model, there were more organized ways for these redistributions to occur. In its scratching, it's often unplanned, slightly ad hoc, whereas peaceful revolutions are usually calculated instances of negotiation and agreement between stakeholders. Despite this, one of the biggest issues that faced all of the publishing projects I engaged with was the ability to mobilize the community to work together. And even though mobilization presents an issue in both models, mobilization was less likely to be an issue for itch scratching, no, sorry, less likely to be an issue for peaceful revolutions when the projects were embedded in an organizational institution. Unfortunately, mobilization in itch scratching projects did present an ongoing issue. So each of the models were positioned to succeed under different conditions. The itch scratching model was best positioned for success in small scale projects where the individual team, the individual or team was motivated and highly skilled to complete the work. Further, the itch scratching model was often more radically open and had the flexibility to opt that often comes with the absence of bureaucratic oversight. The peaceful revolutions model was best positioned at scale and under circumstances where there were bigger redirections of resourcing to support the projects to sustain and scale up. Further, whilst the institution um, or organization structure of the projects within peaceful revolutions models often relied on some administrative oversight, ensuring that the values and goals of open were institutionalized from the ground up um, was a way to be able to mitigate some bureaucratic overreach. So following on from the conditions for success, I sought to determine how well these models supported values of human development. 
Access to education is a global issue. Intellectual property law and policy restricts the way educational materials can be accessed and used. And these restrictions affect the way in which humans are afforded opportunities to live full lives. According to human development theory, removing barriers that impose restrictions on a person's freedom assists in human development and growth. And there is a clear and deep link between a person's freedom and their development. So using this theory to ground my analysis here, I used values of human development and analyzed each of the models. I considered accessibility in terms of licensing and the issues inherent in the physical and digital access to education materials. I also considered contextual accessibility, including the systemic issues of inclusivity, diversity, and bias. I found that choice of license was a common concern for many projects. The majority of projects interviewed made use of a Creative Commons open license, but due to some issues within the publishing process, some projects opted for, opted for a more restrictive, conservative Creative Commons license. Similarly, issues relating to inclusion and diversity in open textbooks remained ongoing. Until open practices are more widespread and institutionalized, open materials are likely con to continue to primarily reflect the status quo. This doesn't mean there aren't diverse vo voices and opinions in open. It does, however, indicate that projects are not always considering diversity and, inclusive and inclusion as an important component of participation. There were also some issues with respect to preference of offering digital content over physical and links to the issues regarding the digital divide in Australia. There were many things that um, were highlighted in my analysis and sometimes I found that there were more questions as a result of my research than answers, um, especially when trying to look at how we can overcome large issues in Australia like the digital divide. Whilst both models supported values of human development to varying extents, when viewing the models holistically, my findings supported a conclusion that the higher education sector is best positioned to succeed in open under circumstances of large scale collaboration and collective action. I propose that for open education to make a real difference on a social level, large scale peaceful revolutions need to occur within our higher education sector and that these revolutions need to be supported by the Australian government. And I call this concept institutionalizing open. The peaceful revolutions model is best positioned for success at scale and has the capacity to support human development. And when done well, these types of peaceful revolutions represent the embodiment of institutionalizing open from the ground up. They may not offer the most liberal choice and license or the autonomy to make choices without overriding policy considerations but the structure and organization of the institution is often more beneficial to implementing open practices. Education institutions are better equipped to consider ways to adequately address common issues in open, including those relating to diversity, inclusivity, bias, access, and accessibility. The strength of the model relies on the collective efforts of many stakeholders who share common goals, values, and beliefs, and are able to use their network of participants to redistribute and share the burdens associated with open publishing. So how does open publishing fit into this bigger scheme of things? Building on the idea of institutionalizing open, I propose that open publishing in higher ed, when institutionalized, can be used as a vehicle to support and progress the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and Sustainable Development Agenda. There are significant issues affecting the world today including poverty, world hunger, climate change, access to healthcare and access to education. These issues affect the most fundamental freedom of a person to live a full life. And in an attempt to address these issues in a collective way, the UN released their 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, which includes these 17 Sustainable Development Goals. In my research, I propose that open publishing and higher ed could be used to better support these goals and could be used to drive education on sustainable development. Through open publishing, curriculum development and alignment with the sustainable development agenda, the education our higher education sector provides can contribute to and support sustainable development in two key ways. First, the higher education sector can integrate targeted sustainable development education into their teaching and learning, using practices and creating open content, which would better equip our students to make contributions to the sustainable development agenda when they graduate. Second, the higher education sector can contribute directly and immediately to the way curriculum and resources aligns with investigating solutions to these sustainable development problems. The idea is to mainstream education for sustainable development in education systems. 
as a lead on from this by embedding sustainable development goal content into curricula and education resources, the expectation is that there will be improved capacity for our education systems to prepare people to pursue sustainable development. Through the institutionalization of open, the values and goals of human development can be built into university publishing in Australian higher education systems. Further, by engaging in the discourse around the UN SDGs, we may be able to better design courses, lectures, assignments, and more specifically, education resources dedicated to specifically addressing sustainable development goal solutions. By making open publishing a viable option within Australian institutions, open content can be broadly created, distributed, used, and reused. Issues associated with contextual access can also be considered and addressed through a framework implemented and managed by the sector. The potential to support human development through this chain of events is significant. In my research, I make a number of recommendations around law reform, institutional changes and government intervention. But most importantly, I recommend large scale collaboration between institutions where a peaceful revolutions model of open publishing is adopted to openly publish education materials for the Australian higher education sector, Australia-wide. I further recommend that the Australian government support this sector-wide initiative. Based on my research and in the absence of collective action and collaboration at scale, and without the partnership and support of the government, many open initiatives fail to thrive. So my final reflection, essentially my knowledge and my research was only made possible by standing on the shoulders of giants. I used concepts from Benkler, Ostrom, Suba, and so many other academics to consider how best to progress open publishing in our higher education sector. It's my hope that the recommendations and thoughts contained in my research provide stepping stones for institutions and governments to consider prioritizing open publishing and supporting and engaging in these practices within. The potential of open is expansive. In the context of higher ed, it could be the vehicle to bridge the gap between education materials that are accessible and education and materials that are truly open, diverse, inclusive, and equitable. And through my research, it has become clear that open provides the possibility. Research on open communities and open practices has shown us that collective action, collaboration, and cooperation at scale is possible, and it can be successful. There is a wealth of potential that exists in open that can be applied to open publishing in higher ed. Whether we choose to explore the potential remains a question. So thank you for listening to my research. I think we're going to open up for questions after. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Wow. Um, can we all give a round of uh, digital applause for, for that talk, everyone? That was a really insightful big picture presentation. And, you know, I think one, uh, one thing that the open educational practices community has been hungry for recently is some serious research and data in this area. So, yeah, I think your work has gone a long way to filling that gap. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of people here who are active or interested in the topic. So we will go to Q&A now. Um, who's got a question for Jess? Stephen, there aren't any questions in the chat yet, but I have a question for Jess. Um, Jess, if you're looking at a cross-institutional collaboration, where do you see the responsibility for this sitting? Hi Angie, thanks for the question. So it may or may not be um, the most appropriate place for it at this point, but you know, Universities Australia currently does things on behalf of our whole community as the peak body. And you know, um, it certainly manages how the universities um, manage their copyright. And I think that um, in the future, it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to at least place um, some of the management of such an initiative in the hands of our peak body, whether or not they'd be open or willing to do it is certainly something I haven't investigated, um, but it would make practical sense to have someone who already has a stake in all of our universities or, or 39 of our universities, the majority, um, and that way um, we would all be able to work together, but still being, um, you know, assisted in one centralised place. Thank you. 
I had another question for you, uh, Jessica. Uh, you mentioned with the itch scratching that um, this seems to be a very successful model, um, but highly individualized. How might a um, how might an institution look at what's going on in terms of these small scale, sometimes maybe individualistic or isolated examples, and leverage that enthusiasm so it becomes more widespread and normalized? An excellent question, Adrian. So essentially, the Peaceful Revolutions model could be made up of lots of little itch scratching projects, um, but they would be better managed in terms of resourcing and redirection of the burden. So like you pointed out, the itch scratching model um, is usually small scale, it's very um, individualized. What the Peaceful Revolutions model offers is that, so for instance, a university would be able to create their own initiatives, such as, you know, I think USQ is, is doing this to some extent already because you are taking what would be smaller projects and placing them under the banner of your, um, you know, your group and you're providing them with support and resourcing. Um, so that would be a really great example of how you're turning these individualized small amounts of um, time and excitement into open into a, a more broader piece. Um, what I also wanted to look at though was the next level up from that. So within institutions, we have that happening, but across the whole sector, we have that happening. So, you know, I personally know all the stuff that QT is doing. I know there's so much going on at USQ with Adrian. You know, I spoke to people at many universities in Australia. I know Call is doing some really great stuff in this space too. So we are all, you know, putting in these efforts um, and some of them range from, you know, individual efforts to larger groups. But what we really lack is the ability to manage all of these efforts collectively. Because if we were actually able to find a way to provide the bridges between all of us, imagine what sort of movement we could do. And I know it is slightly idealistic to think um, that perhaps we could do it. But if you take the SUNY OER project that happened in North America, they have a statewide project now. I mean, we do have more than one state, but the state of New York is pretty big. Um, and so if you combine SUNY and CUNY, what they're doing, um, I think, you know, there is real potential for us to use these lessons that have been learned overseas and try and apply that to Australia. And I like to think that, you know, we have strength in numbers here, and I think that we can really do something like that. Thanks very much, Jess. Hi, I've got a question. Hi, Jess, thanks for your talk. It's very inspiring. Um, so I think we've got a room of the converted here. We all know the benefits of open and we're all very passionate about it, but what tips would you give for us to convey to um, the management in our institutions um, about the benefits of investing um, in these models? Thanks, Katja, that's a really great question. One of the things I did in my research was look at, you know, how can we get buy-in? So buy-in from institutions, but also buy-in from the government. And I think both questions are, the same, are, are sort of a similar response. We need to be able to show a return on investment. These sorts of people don't care about, you know, the nice benefits of open. I mean, maybe they do, but I think ultimately they care about their bottom line. How is it going to benefit us as a university and how is it going to benefit the country? So when I looked at institutions, there's some really clear pathways that it can benefit them. Um, and most of them rely on, um, you know, promotion of providing open. So it's nice to give students open resources. The students like it. And then perhaps they talk to other students about, um, you know, oh, my course has got an open textbook. And so there is a power in positive reputation and a power of positive publicity. And I think that um, there needs to be more research on the actual impact. And I know we're always talking about impact when we're looking at open, but, um, you know, we focus on looking at the impact of like student savings, but uh, what my research doesn't specifically do is look at the impact in terms of a monetary figure for the university. So say for instance, it would be really interesting to look at how, um, you know, using the course that I, I did, the IP open textbook, um, 
I can see that um, the student numbers increased after using an open textbook and whether or not that's because they used an open textbook or just because students were more interested in IP in the following years, um, you know, it'd be really nice to be able to get that sort of data. So um, my advice is we need to be able to show them there's a return on investment, but internally how to do that at an institution, um, I think we, there is still a gap in the, in the knowledge we need to be able to give them hard figures. In terms of the government, um, I found that the return on investment could be closely linked to sustainable development. So as a country, we have to meet certain goals to be able to say we're contributing to the sustainable development agenda. Um, I don't really think we're meeting our goals. Um, I certainly don't think we're meeting our goals in a number of places, like talking about um, you know, our climate change goals and things like that. So to be able to say to the government, here is a clear way we can get people to start thinking about these problems. So in terms of looking at a return on investment for the government, if you give us some money to make open textbooks and to integrate stable development education into our course curriculum, into our assignments, to make our subjects actually teaching about sustainable development agenda items, we can guarantee to you that students will be better prepared to consider sustainable development. But not only that, these students will also be actively thinking about solutions to sustainable development because you guys as a, as a government haven't really been able to progress it by yourselves. Why not use the strength of our research, which is Australia's massive strength, to be able to help with that? So I think by showing the government that there is real opportunity to invest in themselves and in their students by following in open practices. So I think showing that return on investment is really important. Thanks, just some great points there. Uh, hi Jessica, I've got a question which is, um, it's not often that we get to talk to someone who's done quite a lot of research in this, you know, reasonably new area. Um, so from your experience reading the literature and being familiar with the landscape, what do you think are the, uh, the gaps in research on open publishing? Where do you think we should focus our efforts in terms of like collecting data or interviewing people, doing research, PhDs, et cetera? An excellent question, Stephen. I think the real gap is in the economic side of things. Um, you know, I started out, um, I, I do some economic analysis in mind, but I'm by no means an economist. And I think there needs to be more work put into um, looking at the actual monetary aspects of the models. Um, you know, I talk about the redirection of funding and things like that. Um, but someone who can actually dig into the economics of, well, this is what the institutions have and this is where it goes and this is how it can go to different places would be so helpful. Um, you know, using the framework of the models is one thing, but actually being able to put that into practice and convince those who have the power to make this happen, they're going to need um, to know those things about return on investment. They're going to need to be able to put money numbers on things. Um, so I think that's a huge gap that we have. Um, we also, I think that we also need to look more at um, how open can be inclusive and diverse and equitable and how our bias really affects open materials. And I know there's some great research coming out about that. And I know we have um, some great research that was released not that long ago by Sarah Lambert, um, who delves into that. And, um, you know, I think I used her research a lot and, I, you know, she pointed out that there's still work to be done. And I agree, there is still work to be done on that. Um, and the other area I think um, that needs more research is just looking at um, curriculum development in terms of the sustainable development education and the agenda. Um, I'm not an educator. Um, my background isn't in education. And I certainly think that someone with a background in education could really provide the lens that is necessary to really delve into that.
Jess, uh, just a, a follow up question on your research. So, so obviously, this is regarding um, the submission of your PhD. And I wanted to wish you all the best luck with your presentation, because I know that's coming up very soon. Uh, but once you have completed this aspect of your research, uh, of your PhD, what do you see as your direction? And where would you like to be taking your research from here? Gosh, I think that's the million dollar question. I, there's so many different places I want to go. And I thank you for the luck. Um, I'm looking forward to getting my PhD submitted. Um, I'm, I think I'm most passionate about the policy aspects of this research because I do think that this is sort of a starting point to be able to, to make a change um, to the way that we look at collaborating at scale in Australia. And so I'd like to try and get my research out there and then potentially look at um, working with some of our policymakers to see if there is any movement um, that we can get them to at least consider um, investing in some sort of Australia-wide initiative. Brilliant. Thank you. Anyone else got um, any last questions for Jessica? Last chance. Well, if not, um, thanks again, Jessica, and good luck for your future research. Um, before we all leave today, I'm happy to announce that we've got another webinar coming up next month and we'll be hearing from Kate Nixon and Katya Henry from QUT. Um, and they will continue many of today's themes by uh, reflecting on a 12 month trial of the open publishing platform Pressbooks. And so that's gonna be on the 15th of March. Um, at around the same time, we'll uh, confirm details soon and they'll be on the OEP SIG website. And there's some details on the slide there. Um, so now I'll just hand back to Adrian for farewell. Thanks very much, Stephen. I'd like to extend, first of all, my thanks to, uh, to uh, Jessica. Um, and I've been so privileged to be um, talking to Jessica over the last couple of years while she has been doing this and just the level of excitement that I have around especially the human dimension of openness and I hope that um, you found this just as inspirational as I did I I'm really so enthused to see it all come together now and I'm looking forward to seeing this this published so that at least those of us in the community we can start um, moving your citation count in the direction it should be going which is up uh, so thank you and I'm looking forward as soon as you've got anything that is published that you can share, Jessica, please let us know. We will include it in the OEP digest and we'll be able to circulate it throughout the Australasian community. Uh, I also wanted to thank Stephen this morning, uh, without, who's, uh, without whom we wouldn't actually have a program. And so if you have enjoyed this morning and you're looking forward to our March uh, presentation, you have Stephen to thank for that. And I know that he's been working very hard behind the scenes to make sure that we're about a month in advance. And uh, some of the stuff that is coming up this year, I am really looking forward to. So you have Stephen to thank as well. Last Lastly, I, and I would also like to thank um, Angie for being our chat facilitator today. Um, having extra eyes on chat and extra fingers on keyboards is something that should never be undervalued or underestimated. So thank you very much, Angie. Um, and thanks very much to everyone who has joined us this morning. Um, I hope that this has given you plenty to think about.
plenty of ideas that you might be able to take back to your own institutions. And I'll look forward to seeing you all again at the OEP SIG meeting and then in March as well. So I'll leave you to the rest of your morning and afternoon. Thanks once again.